And we're always concerned about these threats. One, natural disasters. Uh, for whatever reason, it seems like particularly the Caribbean, Central America, very vulnerable to hurricanes and uh, volcanoes and flooding and mass migration incident, uh, incidents. People, South Florida knows this very well, from possibility always from Haiti, the possibility from Cuba. Uh, and it's, it's something that we plan for. Uh, we would not be the primary responder to a mass migration incident, that's DHS, Department of Homeland Security, but if it became large, the US military would have to get involved. And also, quite frankly, I think the fear of this, the concern about it really, um, to be fair, sort of drives a bit of our thinking about our Haiti policy right now, right? Um, if you take a look at drug movements uh, still, cocaine movements in particular, uh, as one of the big challenges, you know, that's the production every year. Uh, still uh, 1,300, 1,400 metric tons. Um, most by sea, some by air. Uh, of course, the production here in the Andes, uh, transit routes, and then uh, consumption. Uh, in the United States and elsewhere. But there's really some new trends here. One, uh, the fact that we're seeing more and more cocaine move uh, towards Europe, uh, particularly via Africa. Uh, and in fact, about 38% of cocaine is not consumed in the United States. Hmm? I'm sorry, 38%? 38% of, of cocaine uh, is, it goes, you know, goes to non-US markets, okay? Um, um, and in fact, there's really been a globalization. Is yeah. That yes. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's really a new trend, huh? Uh, and I think it comes from a lot of areas. I think it's one. The United States has had some success in interdiction. We've had some uh, actually reduction in demand, uh, and people always look for kind of new markets. Uh, and in fact. <coughs> You know, Brazil now is the number two global consumer of cocaine. The UK is the number one per capita consumer of cocaine. Um, and in fact, this is kind of a new trend. In other words, you know, I think when I started in this business, um, uh, there was a cocaine trade. A lot of countries in Latin America said, all right, we'll kind of help you maybe, but uh, this really is the United States problem because all the consumption is in the United States. Now, there was a point to that, but the, the problem is, is that trafficking, production and trafficking of cocaine and coca has an enormously insidious effect on both the countries where it's produced, obviously, and the transit countries, right? So it becomes everyone's problem. It's, you know, it's, it, there is a consumption problem in the United States, but now there's also a public health and consumption problems in many countries in Latin America and Europe. That tendency of trafficking organizations to completely undermine uh, law enforcement institutions uh, and courts. So it's a real issue. And there's also kind of a circularity by these um, uh, networks. You see, you know, it's not only cocaine moving, it's also euros, dollars coming back, it's weapons coming back, it's the utilization of these same networks for other issues. In terms of how it gets to the United States, I said 20% by air. Almost all of that, according to Jetta South, originates in Venezuela. Hmm. Uh, maritime activity, about 80% right now. Uh, most of that is coming up the literal areas of Central America, uh, then on to land and up to the United States, and then the other stuff going directly to West Africa uh, and Europe. In fact, Guinea-Bissau may, may now be sort of the world's first true narco state. We talk a little bit about Colombia when we talk about the region, um, just because a lot of Americans don't understand this has really been a relative success story. Uh, you all probably know that, but you know the fact now that the army and police in Colombia very well respected, the fact that the numbers of people in the FARC uh, less than half than they were 10 years ago, huge reductions in major crimes in Colombia. Um, the <coughs> taking back of the Colombian countryside. The government now has control of virtually every part of Colombia. Uh, and the fact that this really has worked in a partnership. In other words, you know, more than a decade, actually two decades of work with Southern Command and others uh, with Colombia has really imparted them enormous professionalism. You know, they were able to rescue those hostages uh, a year and a half ago. Um, there are now Mexican pilots in Colombian helicopter schools training uh, for the 
helicopters uh, that will be used under uh, under <coughs> the Merida Initiative. Um, so you know the. Um, the Colombians are very quietly sort of talking to Mexico and Panama and uh, Peru about their experiences uh, in fighting uh, the drug trade and, and narco-terrorists. So um, it really is a, a good news story. Um, that concern about Central America, I mentioned um, very high uh, crime rates. Of course, the huge problem with Maras, Manillas, uh, maybe 100,000 of these folks uh, in uh, Mexico and Latin America. That kind of kind of indiscriminate, almost terrorist-like crime, in this case, uh, people being killed uh, in buses in Guatemala and other places. Honduras, and we can talk about this maybe in the Q, Q's and A's period, but uh, uh, you know, you will, I think you, everyone in this room sort of knows this general story. Um, and of course, President Lobo being inaugurated and kind of slowly working his way back into the Honduras, slowly working their way back into the inter-American system. Uh, but it was an interesting issue for Southern Command. And I say that because uh, we've had a long association with the Honduran military, a lot of education, a lot of training over the years. Uh, and yet, you know, there was a coup. I mean, we can argue about the legal definition, but you know, they did sort of take the president and put him in a plane, take him out of the country. And you sort of think, why? You know, how, how did that happen? What does that mean for uh, really now decades of, in general, a growing professionalism in, in Latin American militaries? Um, we also have a challenge. We call these, you, these are, of course, our uh, folks from ALBA, uh, led by Hugo Chavez. Um, you know, to, to be diplomatic about it, uh, we all know these gentlemen have different ideas about what representative democracy is and uh, what market economics is and how countries should be organized. Um, uh, but they are a block and, you know, I think if even they would admit they are sort of reflexively and deeply suspicious of U.S. motives uh, uh, in, the, in, in the region. Uh, it's, uh, it's that sort of Daniel Ortega's office, yes. Yeah, I know that office. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, the new external actors. Uh, uh, you know, China, much more active over the last five or ten years in Latin America, become the number one or two trading partner with many countries in the region. Uh, Russia, uh, much more active in the region once again, uh, particularly in Venezuela with the sale of arms, including some pretty advanced arms. Uh, and Iran, Ahmadinejad has visited uh, Latin America, I think four times. Several presidents have gone to see him. He signed, Iran has signed lots of agreements on technology and trade and other issues. They have about doubled the number of embassies they have in Latin America. And you sort of leave your head, you know, you have to scratch your head thinking why all that is. But it's something that obviously we're concerned about and we watch. I mean, as, as you know, Iran, uh, additional sanctions were imposed by, uh, by the UN and Iran only a few weeks ago. And this is kind of what we focus on, thinking about all these challenges. Uh, one, as I mentioned, illicit trafficking, okay, and that's largely through Jihad of South and Key West and the tactical operations they do. Uh, peacekeeping. Uh, there's a major global peacekeeping initiative that's been in place now for five or six years. It's actually Department of State money that they give to DOD to train and equip peacekeeping forces around the world, but we actually have worked very closely with several Latin American nations on this. And one of the reasons I think we were able to work very well with MINUSTA, the UN mission in, in Haiti, is that we in fact worked with some of those countries for many years uh, in this area. Um, of course, we do uh, lots of joint combined training uh, and operations. It's everything from uh, naval exercises. This is UNITAS. I think we're now in our 51st year of this with Navy throughout the region. You know, to small uh, unit exchanges uh, by special forces and others. And then, of course, disaster relief, I think, is, is most typified by operations in Haiti earlier in the year. Um, <coughs> As I mentioned, we really are a, 
uh, you know, an interagency organization, uh, not only all parts of the U.S. military, uh, but all of these other government agencies have full or part-time people uh, working with us every day. Uh, we have liaison officers, foreign military officers from these nations working in our command every day. Uh, we work with lots of educational um, ed ed institutions, the 